Snafu there, and welcome to Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. My name is Andrew Murata, host of the program, and happy to be with you. There we go. Happy to be with you. It is show number 142. Thank you for tuning in live to our audience here on Facebook. Uh, Happy to be a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Also a member of Voice Ed Radio Canada and certainly a member of the iTunes podcast community. Appreciate uh, all the, the reviews and the, the positive uh, comments people have left, right? So many times people are so afraid of social media because of the negativity. Hey, there's a lot of positivity out there happening too. And that's why uh, we're happy to be doing this program. So thank you for tuning in. It is show number 142. We had some tech issues last week. Um, We had to move some things around, but we are looking good and sounding good this week. We're going to meet our guest in just a minute. Karen Gross is with us today. She is the author of this book, and she's she's done a lot in her career. She's got a lot going on. I'm really proud to talk to her. What a more uh, timely topic, really, right, about what's happening. There's so much trauma uh, happening right now. We're going to talk about that and the relationships with schools uh, in a minute. If you are tuning in live, please leave us a comment or question. Um, And again, thank you for that. I do want to thank today's sponsors. They're a little bit out of the realm of education, but they're working for me. I connected with Rios Sunglasses. Here's their logo here, R-H-E-O-S, Rios Sunglasses. And they're fantastic. If you're out uh, on the coast like Karen, I know she's up New England, likes to be on the water, these float. They're floating. You won't lose them in the water, uh, just like I did multiple times this summer. So they're sponsoring the program. Marada 15 is uh, the discount code, and they'll give you a discount. Check them out. They offer uh, payment uh, installations, and they're only about 50 bucks, uh, which is great for sunglasses, and I love them. So They got all that fancy kind of film on them and all that stuff that I don't understand how they work, but I love them. So check them out, R-H-E-O-S, riosgear.com, and I appreciate them sponsoring the program. So let's get to it. Again, we're going to meet Karen here in a moment. We're going to talk about her book. But one of the parts in here, uh, she talks about trauma, right? Naming it and then taming it. I love the sound of that, naming it and taming it, getting kids to talk about it. But we, as school, uh, as educators and school leaders, what can we do to be a trauma-informed educator, to be a trauma-informed school? And she writes about the five S's, stability, structure, subtlety, safety, and someone, right? Stability, structure, subtlety, safety, and someone. That we as school leaders, we as educators need to provide that for kids and, and adults not knowing what their trauma is or what it could be. Uh, and I just like that, right? Structure, the structure of school, uh, the routine, the cafeteria spots, the high fives, uh, uh, you know, that we used to give back in the day. Hey, mom, Karen, my mom's watching. She's my biggest fan. Um, and being there for someone, right? Being there for someone. Uh, I, I know that's important as educators. That's why we show up. So, I appreciated that part of the book and and a lot of parts that we're going to talk to Karen about. Uh, But really, again, uh, the taming of the trauma, stability, structure, subtlety, safety, and be that someone for that someone. So let's bring Karen in here. We're going to unmute her and bring her in to the program. And bam, there she is. Karen, welcome to Education, Leadership, and Beyond. Hello, nice to be with you and your listener. Yeah, and so so uh, grateful for you, uh, for your book and uh, a little introduction. It says, Karen Gross is an author and educator, serves as an instructor of continuing education at Rutgers Graduate School of Social Work and a visiting professor at Bennington College, a former college president. 
She also serves as senior policy advisor for the U.S. Department of Education. Karen, you are an educator through and through. I've been an educator for a long time, and it's probably the most satisfying occupation one could have, really. Yeah. And I could feel the warmth in your smile and just talking to you a few minutes off air, uh, Karen. But what else? What else did I miss in your introduction? I know you, you're doing a lot, and we're going to get into some of it over the program. But, but what else should I mention or can you mention for us in, in an introduction? So I think one of the most important realizations I had is that as important as being a college president has been for me, if you really want to do something important in education, you have to back up the train. You have to back up the train really far. And one of the reasons that I write children's books is because we have to start with education with our youngest children and help them succeed. Because kids carry that education forward in time, and they carry their trauma forward in time. So if we can help our youngest kids, we will be doing an amazing thing for education. Yeah. And we're going to dive into that, too. You wrote a, a children's series uh, and, uh, I, you know, the Lady Lucy series. I can't wait to see it. You, you said you get one to my niece, Lucy Bentley, which is fantastic. Um, but let's start with your most recent work, Karen. Again, I, I mentioned it here, uh, and this is it. And the timing of this was just unbelievable. What what motivated you to write this book, Karen? So obviously the pandemic is not what motivated me. That happened to be really good timing, and the page proofs actually came in so the book could be updated to deal with the pandemic. Yeah. But what really happened is I started watching children. I started watching children across the educational spectrum. And I saw that some of them were not learning. I saw that some of them were falling asleep in class. I saw that some of them were hungry. I saw that some of them couldn't concentrate. And I said, hang on a second here. We've got to figure out what's going on with these children. And we've got to find a way to help them. And that really started me thinking about who are our students? And what are their lives like outside of school? Because whatever those lives are like, they bring it into school. So that's what motivated the book. Yeah. And really, you know, uh, there's been a lot of attention recently about ACEs. Uh, and and you, you go into that. And, and the film uh, that came out, uh, the name is escaping me right now. Um, but it really, you go into that about the book, about the ACEs and the ACEs scores and, and what it means for these kids' lives uh, in detail there. Well, one of the interesting things for me is that ACEs measure family dysfunction. But what we're seeing now is the dysfunction is way beyond the family. There's community dysfunction, communities where there are shootings and other horrible things going on. There are natural disasters with fires and floods and hurricanes. And then we have the pandemic, which is also impacting children. So ACEs measure one piece of what's happening to children. And then there's all of these other things that are impacting them. And that impact hurts them in terms of their learning and their psychosocial success. And we should care about it. And sadly, I mean, what I would say to you is one of the hardest things for me is the realization that we can do something about this, but many of our educators, many, sadly too many, have not been trauma trained. And your, and your book talks about that and really brings it to the forefront. So again, the timing of it uh, is great. And one of those points that I open with, uh, Karen, the five S's, right? Um, stability, structure, subtlety, safety, and someone being those five things, or at least one of them, right, for the kids, what would you say then are suggestions for the adults to better perform these concepts in school? So one of the things we should try to do is restore all of those five S's because that's what trauma takes away. And I'd say the most significant one, and perhaps the hardest one right now, with the pandemic is a child having at least one, ideally two adults who truly care about them, who genuinely understand them 
and support them and their learning. And in fact, one of the most interesting pieces of research, since you mentioned ACEs, is something called PACEs, which is positive childhood experiences. And the more PACEs you have, the better off you are. And the biggest positive childhood experience is having an adult who cares about you. And what better person to do that than educators? And by the way, since you're familiar with this too, coaches can do this. It doesn't have to be the teacher in the classroom. I define educator broadly. And so an adult who cares about you is what we need. Ideally, two of them for it's, every child. It, it sounds like you're the adult that cares about someone there with you. Do you have a pet that's trying to get on your lap? I, I do. I, I, who, who is that? This Come is on. my pet. <laughs> Um, his name is Wrinkles, and, and here's the key to Wrinkles. Um, I've written a children's story about Wrinkles, and it's called Wrinkles Does Not Like Social Distancing. And actually, it's available to people. It's free of charge. And he's featured in it, and it's been read by thousands and thousands of children. And it shows what he did when he didn't get attention. And all the activities I tried to do with him to make him feel better, none of which work particularly well, <laughs> um, but you'll see him ripping up boxes, you'll see him tearing up books, you'll see him doing all sorts of not so good things um, as he tried to deal with social distancing. Yeah, and it doesn't sound like he, when mom is on the podcast, he doesn't like that either. No, not much. <laughs> and in that sense, he's very similar to children yeah. who don't like yeah. it when their parents are um, on the phone. And I'm actually going to move so that maybe he won't um, disturb me. Well, you're doing, a, you're doing a great job. And Karen, again, I'm looking forward to getting to know you a little more. But you could, you could sense and, again, feel that this – this is real. The fact that you are out here advocating for kids and, and noticing this. And again, not just kind of complaining about it, but you took action. You're talking about it. And again, it's in here that we can be uh, a help uh, for kids. So kudos to you, uh, for, you know, bringing this message. Well, you're making a really good point, too. Now is the time for action, not words. I mean, kids need our help now. They need us to do something. Thinking just in terms of theory, and that's an interesting thing about my book, it's not just theory. It's actually how you do things. What activities can you do to create a trauma-responsive environment? And here's one, especially for kids who are learning online. Use their name. Use their name repeatedly. Greet them using their name. Refer to them in class by their name, like, oh, what a really good comment you made, Sarah. Or, Lucy, that was a really good question yesterday. And David, that was really thoughtful, what you said. So all of those help kids feel a connection, even in a world where we're not as connected as we could be or should be. Amen, Karen. Um you go into the book, though, about some of your personal things that happened to you after 9-11, uh, some struggles at work, some struggles in your personal life. Uh, and really, you talked about overcoming a series of, uh, of tough events. Uh, do you want to talk about that, That how that motivated you, again, to incorporate this in the book as well? I think it's very hard to understand trauma. That's wrinkles, by the way. I think it's very hard to understand trauma from a distance. And one of the things that's been most important to me is authenticity. And I think sharing the experiences I've had, including the negative ones, are important. But they also should be ones that give people hope. Because trauma can be overcome. It never goes away. That's an interesting observation about it. It doesn't disappear. But one of the things that can happen 
is that you can find strategies to move forward. And in some ways, not in all ways, but in some ways, trauma can benefit you. Some of the negatives can be turned into positives. And so for me, positivity, which you and I chatted about earlier, is also important. So I like not to be defined by the not so good things that happened to me, but the ways I've figured out to move forward and help others. I love the message. And again, similar to, to right now, right? Like teachers have content and they have the, you know, the curriculum they got to get through, but it's so important to, to listen and build those relationships. And you talk about that when you were teaching law right after 9-11, that some of your colleagues were diving right into it. And you were like, hold on, these people need to talk and, and what, what they're feeling and what they're going through because you were downtown Manhattan, no? Yes, I was right there. Yeah. And in fact, I saw the Twin Towers fall wow. with some of my students at the time. Wow. So it struck me, you can't just say, oh, where were we before we were so rudely interrupted? Yeah. You have to actually pay attention to the psychological readiness of students to learn. You know, th there's a saying that I have that education happens in many places and spaces of which the classroom is but one. That says to me that we've got to look for all of those places where learning can take place it is not just the delivery of substance, as important as substance is. It's lots of opportunities for education in many places and many spaces. Karen, let's shift gears a little bit now. You, you mentioned about the Lady Lucy series and uh, I mean, that's full disclosure. That's a, I'd, lo I'd love to start a children's book. I don't, I don't know where to start with it, but you know, tell me about the inspiration here. Here you wrote these amazing books here, but then you wrote a, a children's series too. Can you share a little bit about that? Sure. So I've written, I think it's now 10 children's books um, in addition to my adult books. And one of the reasons I did it, and the books are all trauma responsive, is to help kids believe in the power of the possible. So all of the books operate off of a trauma responsive principle, namely believe in yourself, believe in what you can achieve and overcome obstacles. So the Lady Lucy series starts with this little girl who wants to be a knight in the middle ages. And she's told, no, no, girls can't be knights. And she says, well, wait, wait a minute, where does it say that? Is there some rule or something? They can't come up with a rule. She takes the tests of knighthood, which they make really hard for her. I mean, nobody could do those tests, but she's creative, she's clever, she's smart, she thinks boldly, she overcomes these hurdles and becomes a knight. And then the series is about all the quests that she goes on as a knight. And so, the Lady Lucy series has Lady Lucy's ghost quest and Lady Lucy's dinosaur quest and Lady Lucy's unicorn find. And each of her stories is an effort to overcome some problem and find a solution. And isn't that really what education is about? Helping kids learn to problem solve? helping them learn to think through problems. At the end of the day, that's the best thing that education can give you. I love it, I love it. Karen, oh, you've been- Oh, I have to just tell you something. I'm Go. sorry to interrupt. No, that's okay. One of the books I wrote is a ghost, is a joke book, a Lady Lucy joke book, <laughs> where she, um, comes up with a lot of jokes about giraffes. So it's a giraffe joke book. Okay, so it sounds a little funny, but you know something? People can read the jokes, they can laugh together, families can read it together. And all the giraffes pictured in that book are ones from my own giraffe collection. 
which is a collection of giraffes made out of every kind of fabric or material known to personhood. Are you a, are they, is the giraffe collection close by? You're, you're moving around a lot today. You're staying in tune, but is the giraffe collection close by that you could bring? Well, I can show you some giraffes. Sure. <laughs> Hang on. I'll take you with me. Hang Karen, on. I've never had somebody so mobile during the podcast. You're amazing. Is this good? Here. Okay. <laughs> so let me, here. Oh, wow. Can you see that one? We can. Where can is that? Can you see this little one? Okay. So this is what I do with children. Do you see this giraffe? Yeah. Tell him to fall down. Fall down, giraffe. Now tell him to stand up. Stand up, giraffe. Oh, he's like the character from Woody. Uh, from Toy Story, yeah. So there are two from the collection. There's a painting. Wow. So. Beautiful. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to reading some of the, the jokes. But what I was going to say, Karen, how, how, tell me your process for writing. Do you, do you, I mean, you're moving now, but. I write you, standing up. Do you? I've never written sitting. I write standing up at the kitchen counter. And do you Every, go, it's in your home? You go to a Starbucks? Where do you, where, where do you? Usually in my home. Yeah. But I can't write in a chair. I can't write in a desk. And actually, sometimes I get up and walk around and do my best thinking, walking or looking at the water. Yeah. Now, the passions clearly in, in this book and in, in your first book are revolved around your educational life. But you seem to have two gifts. You can do this, but also the creativity of the stories. How do you generate the creativity of Lady Lucy? Um, I think there's real power in our imagination. And I, I think for me, one of the ways that I dealt with really difficult times at various stages was through my imagination. And whether that's dance or music or writing or poetry or whatever it is that works for people to help them navigate forward. Um, for me, it was always writing and storytelling. So in many ways, you could say I'm just a storyteller. Yeah. Not just a, I'm a storyteller yeah. Yeah. for adults and children. Yeah. And you've lived a lifetime of stories through education. Uh, again, college president. Uh, you're doing a lot of speaking. And, and you, you, you were an, a lawyer as well, right? You teach law. <laughs> Yeah, I was a lawyer. And by the way, that's a skill um, that's hugely important. It's a thinking skill. And although I practiced law for many years um, and served as an expert witness, what's best about being a lawyer is its capacity to help you think clearly yeah. and articulate clearly what's on your mind, what an argument is like, how to be persuasive. So instead of using it to build corporations, I use it to build belief in self. I love your message today. I think it's fantastic. But another passion is sports, uh, yes. Karen. And, and you kind of told me that at the end of our introduction here. And I was like, wow, like I'm a sports guy. Where does this passion of sports come from? So I'm a serious sports fan long before I became a college president. Okay, so... One of my very first clients as a lawyer at a very big law firm was a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. and, and this was a really big deal back then in the late 70s to have a woman who was his lawyer. And he was really proud of having a lawyer who was a woman. So anyway, we go to a meeting. This is early on and there, we're late. We get to the meeting, there are all these men sitting around the U-shaped table, and he walks in with me right there and says, I'd like you to meet Karen Groves. She's my lawyer, and she's a woman. And he said that to the whole group. Everybody sort of like burst out laughing. And I'm thinking, well, that's a funny thing to say. I'm right there. She is my lawyer, and she's a woman. And I actually 
wrote an article about that with that title, sort of like a country and Western song. She's right, a lawyer and she's a woman. <laughs> um, and that started me going to professional sporting events because he would get me his tickets and I would go. And I just became a fan of both football and basketball. And I'd been a baseball fan. I grew up outside of Boston. So I'd suffered with the Red Sox mm. um, for decades and decades and decades. And I was at the 67 World Series. So I'm a serious sports fan. And I know my sports. But here, you want one other really interesting thing? I love it. Everything okay. you tell me has been interesting. OK, as a college president, you can't bet on March Madness. You can't even, I don't mean even betting for money. You can't even participate in a March Madness pool. Pools, yeah. So I used to do them quietly by myself, never shared them with anyone, never did anything. I would just do the March Madness brackets. OK. I go to Washington to be the senior policy advisor to the U.S. Department of Education. And as you may know, the secretary of education back then, Arnie Duncan, and the then president, Barack Obama, were both basketball fans, mm -hmm. keen on that. And Barack Obama did a bracket, and the Department of Education had a bracket contest, a March Madness bracket contest. So I thought, oh. Here's my chance. <laughs> so I fill out the bracket. I turn it in. The Department of Education has 4,000 people who work in it in DC. I won that bracket <laughs> for the Department of Education. <laughs> now, my original prize was a basketball signed by the Secretary of Education which nice. is great, and I have it, and I actually gave it to the college, and I put it in a special case, and it says, thank you, Karen, for all your good work for students. And I'm in my office at the Department of Education, and the phone rings. I pick it up, and the person says to me, are you the college president who won the March Madness bracket? I said, yes. Oh, said the person, the president would like you to attend the row, the ceremony for the winner in the Rose Room at the White House. Would you like to come as his guest? <laughs> and I thought, now what kind of question would I like to come? <laughs> huh? Yes, of course I'd like to come. So actually, I, I went to the White House, which um, and was there as the guest of the president when Kentucky won the March Madness tournament and the year that I won the March Madness bracket for the Department of Education. That is a fantastic story. My mother's uh, putting the basketballs in here. I thought she was going to write something about She's a Yankee fan, Karen, so I oh, thought there was be a little conflict. But that's an amazing story. Wow. Yeah, wow. so I, I, you know, people... Look, I'm, I'm not very tall, and, and so when I used to go to all the games at the college, and after each game I had a tradition that I would go out onto the court, whether it was a men's basketball game or a women's basketball game, and shake the hand of the coach, whether they won or they lost, before they left and went into the locker room with the players. And on some occasions, you know, the players and I pre-pandemic would hug, whether it was male or female players. And obviously, there's a huge height difference between me and the players. Well, just to tell you one more story, one year, our team won the ECACs. And the idea was to climb up this ladder to cut down a piece of the net. Mm. Not good. I, I don't like heights. <laughs> the idea of climbing up a ladder like that, mm, not good. But anyway, the players surrounded me and said, we'll stand around the ladder while you walk up. And if you just even slightly trip, we'll all catch you. We're practically at the basket anyway. <laughs> so I, I climbed up. I 
clipped off a piece of the net and hanging in my home is a piece of that net, that yeah. piece of net with a photograph of all the players surrounding the ladder to make sure I didn't fall. Karen, you, you got a lot more books to write because you got <laughs> just tremendous stories. You got tremendous passion. I, I think it's fantastic. And uh, let's do that second uh, show. We talked about doing another one, but you've done a lot and you're a doer and, and uh, I, I, I'm inspired right now. I got to tell you. Oh, I'm glad. Thank you. Yeah. Your, the, the passion with sports, though, have you related that to the work that you do with kids in schools and stuff? Do you bring that in? Because I, well, I see a lot of connections there myself. Yes. Well, first of all, I think a good coach on a campus is invaluable. I think a good coach at any level can help children find the structure and stability and the someone that they need in order to navigate forward. And anyone who downplays the role of athletics is really missing what importance it can have in the life of a child and a young person um, moving forward. Yeah. Now, one interesting thing, though, is I used to watch how almost every athlete at the college would do what the coach asked exactly as the coach asked for it. If they needed to be there at six in the morning to get on a bus to go to a game, they would be there. If they needed to be at a practice at eight at night and throw 50 shots from the corner, they would do that. If they needed to go to batting practice in a place that was different than where we were because there was snow on the ground, they would do that. And yet, not all of them took that discipline and brought it into the classroom. And I, in the beginning, I thought, wait a minute, this is a transportable skill. They can show up on time. They can do the work. They can do things repeatedly. They can understand mistakes and they can get better. Those are all really powerful skills in a classroom. Why can't they bring them in? And then it dawned on me and it was a really significant revelation that they feel good about themselves doing sports, but they didn't bring that same confidence and that same belief in self into the classroom. And what that said to me is we need to build that into the classroom because they know how to do things when they're passionate and feel good about themselves. Let's help them feel good about themselves in the classroom. Well said, well said. Uh, this was great, Karen. We have a few of our friends watching. Uh, uh, Taylor Hardy's a Division One soccer player at University of Rhode Island up your way. She's a teacher with us and a coach, uh, as well as Rick Jetter here uh, as an educator. So uh, appreciate them tuning in. Karen, this was fantastic. Let's get uh, let's get to the rapid fire here because uh, we'll be going on and on here, but we definitely going to have to have that second episode. <laughs> I would welcome. Uh, the, these are the uh, quick answers, Karen. Whatever comes to your uh, mind first. Are you ready? I'm ready. This sounds were, like a game show. You were okay. born ready. You were born ready. <laughs> All right, last book you read. Last book I read was by Reeve Lindbergh, the daughter of Charles Lindbergh. Um, and it was called Under a Wing and um, a fascinating book. She's actually remarkable, as was her mother, Anne Morrow Lindbergh. And I have to say, I learned a lot about them as a family and the hurdles they face, which were not insignificant, including the kidnapping and death of their young son. Mm. Last movie you saw? Last movie I saw, I don't know if you'd call it a movie, I've been watching the Formula One series. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I hadn't um, understood much about car racing before this. Um, actually, my son races motorcycles, so I, I should, and used to ski race, so I should have mm -hmm. known a lot about this. Um, but I've been struck by the level of athleticism and concentration and competitive competitiveness 
of Formula One racing. I mean, it's a combination of science and technology and speed, but also remarkable concentration capacity and sense of self. So that's what I've been watching, Formula One. It's a series actually on Netflix, just. Okay. Uh, favorite place to travel? Anywhere near the water. Yeah. If now I you be on the water. I think Do you I was live in New England now? What? Do you live in New England? Yes, I live actually in Gloucester, Massachusetts, Gloucester. at least during the pandemic. Okay. All right. A fishing village, a fishing town originally. I, I'm, I'm bracing for impact when I say this. Next one. Your favorite sports team. I'm sorry. Your, your mother is going to start <laughs> throwing things. Sorry. Uh, it's the Boston Red Sox, but, but the Patriots are not my favorite football team. I, I just have to say that. Um, but the Red Sox are a team that I have held near and dear. Um, and I have many, many Red Sox stories, um, including from when I was a college president, when the, um, one of the major donors to the college was a Red Sox fan. And a remarkable woman, really. Um, and I went to a CVS and got her Red Sox earrings, okay? I, I think they may have cost $9. I, I may be exaggerating. Anyway, she wore those for the entire season that the Red Sox played in that year. And I'm thinking, here's this amazing woman who could be wearing, you know, like diamonds and rubies, and she's wearing the $9 CVS earrings that I gave her. Wow. Yeah, that's beautiful. What did you feel about Tom Brady leaving? Did you is that profound for you, or because you're not a Patriots fan? Um, well, I think it makes for an interesting season this year to see how Brady does without his coach, mm -hmm. and see how his coach does without his quarterback. That'll be another story for another day. What's your favorite season in New England? There's a they Fall. got all four. Fall, Fall right now. I adore the fall. I adore the leaves changing. I adore that it's not boiling hot, but you can still be outdoors. I enjoy nature's painting, which is really what fall is. It's beautiful. Karen, you shared a lot of passions. What's something that gets under your skin? What's something that, that, that bothers you? People who aren't nice. Mm -hmm. I just... They, it's way too important to be kind. It takes an effort to be mean. People should stop being mean. Bothers me when people are rude and disrespectful. Yeah. There's just no justification for it. I know there's trauma when, fill in the blank. I know there's trauma when people aren't living up to their highest potential. Mm. One of the jobs answer. of an educator is to help you become your best self. When you can't do that, it may be because trauma is interfering. Something about Karen Gross that people do not know. I think they probably don't know that I do sports. I don't just watch sports. I actually do them. I kayak, I ski, I camp, I exercise. So I, I think people look at me and think, oh, she must just like sit there at her computer or something. And when she's not doing that, she's probably reading to children. But actually, I do sports um, and adore doing them as well. And you're going to have to get some exercise now because Wrinkles is telling you you got to go out. Yes, Wrinkles is telling me this is the end of the bonus round. We better hurry up. Karen, best COVID advice that you would give uh, to other people right now? Wear a mask and socially distant from each other. And really, seriously, the science is clear on that yeah. part. Do what you can, not just to protect yourself, but to protect others. It's For me, it's not even a debatable issue. It's the yeah. right thing to do. Amen. Uh, you shared a lot of quotes. I love I love so many of the things you said today. 
Do you have a favorite? Is there something that you want to share out, um, you know, a quote to end this with? Um, I'd share this one. Be yourself. Everyone else is taken. <laughs> Love it. Karen, how can people get in touch with you? I know you speak. Uh, I know you uh, you consult uh, you, the writing. How, you know, people are interested in you. What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? The best way is through my website, which is www.karengrosseducation.com. There's a form there. You can actually reach out. I answer people. I really do. Um, so you can email me through the website. And the website shares my books. It shares some of my thinking. It shares teacher's tips. So I hope it'll be helpful to people. And Karen, I want to do a giveaway uh, of the book. Uh, I have my copy, but we were so lucky enough to have a second. So uh, if you are watching this on replay um, and you think this would be interesting for you, just leave, leave us a comment. Leave us why you think this would be meaningful, why you like Karen's episode. Leave us something that'll get my attention. And we'll ship that other book out because uh, I think the timing of this is just perfect. So we'll give that other book away. And uh, uh, again, the children's series sounds fantastic, especially if you have a Lucy in your life. So uh, appreciate this, uh, uh, Karen. Guys, this was Karen Groats uh, here on Education Leadership Beyond. Uh, Karen, you, you were very entertaining here, but obviously very bright and, and very positive. So I appreciate your time. So thank you for having me. Thank you for your wonderful questions. They were really good. And thank you to your listeners for tuning in. And I hope what I said is helpful as they help the children that they serve. Man, if they were all like you, Karen, the, uh, the world would be a better place. We're going to bring the music in here. Uh, one last shout out. When you're on the water, Karen, if you're out on the water, Rio Sunglasses, our sponsor that today. Good. Uh, R-H-E-O-S. Thank you to them. Uh, this was episode 142 on Education, Leadership, and Beyond. I'm at Andrew Murata 21 on Twitter. If I could help uh, in any way, don't hesitate to reach out. Let me cue up this music one more time, and we will say goodbye to Miss Karen. Karen, stay on the line. Thank you. Our information is below. Check her out. Uh, Karen Gross Education. Or, yeah, KarenGrossEducation.com. Thank you so much, Karen.